Part three, e-learning lesson three. We're still looking at what we can learn about the craft of writing from the super by Judith Wright. And I deliberately changed the background colour of the slide to be black because she's talking about the sea at night. So, stanza three. And she begins with four because she's giving a reason for her desire for the surfer to go home when um, night falls. For on the sand the grey wolf sea lies gnarled. Cold twilight winds split the wave hairs and shows the bones they worry in their wolf teeth. Oh, wind blows and sea crouches on the sand, fawning and mouthing. Drops there and snatches again, drops and again snatches its broken toys, its whitened pebbles and shell. Love that stanza. So I'm sort of doing every verse, I just broke out the key points for this. So stanza three, new stanza because there's been a shift again. She's giving the reason now for the second stanza. I want you to notice the use of snar. It's an onomatopoeic word, a sound that attempts to imitate a real world sound and snarl and growl or um, suggest danger based on what our own reference points are. If you haven't ever heard a dog growling and snarling and gnashing its teeth, you would still recognise these danger implied through that sound. In this um, stanza, she uses an extended metaphor and zoomorphism of, of the sea. She, uh, she describes the sea as a grey wolf. If you are comparing an object or thing to a person, it's called personification. But if you are refer, uh, comparing an object or an inanimate thing to an animal, it's called zoomorphism. So she uses the extended metaphor, zoomorphism, to develop the darker tone of her final stanza and describe the threat to the surfer that she sees if he stays out on the waves after sunset. The poet compares the sea to a predator, dangerous and frothing at the mouth, mad, and gives the sea the power in the relationship previously shared with the sur surfer in stanza one. And the illusion of the safe environment that the poet, who was the observer of the surfer, witnessed during the daylight, is removed with the loss of life. Equally in this verse, in addition to, in this stanza, in addition to the wolf being compared to the sea and it having power, she also introduces another player, the wind. The wind is as powerful as, as the sea and it's in conflict with the sea, splitting it into wave hairs and the wind is able to show the bones of the sea um, that she describes as worried in the wolf teeth. Short and sweet. Now what can we learn about the craft of writing from stanza three? Well an extended metaphor allows the composer to make a complex comparison between two things or ideas and allows the composer to create a vivid sensory picture for the reader in a memorable way. And we'll be doing some exercises in part four, on extended metaphor. Um, they're difficult to create. If you can find a metaphor that works for a line, that's really great. But if you ever think of a really good extended metaphor, that's a, that's a mark of a very skilled writer. Okay, now you're going to go on to the interactive exercises set for three and the interactive exercise is set for part three lesson three end on the big ideas that are embedded in the cross of three stanzas of this poem and for your send in exercise you're going to do two things you're going to take one of the big ideas from this text you're not going to write about a surfer or, or the threat of waves or ocean you're just going to take one of the abstract ideas and you're going to create your own piece of imaginative writing and then you're going to do a reflection on your imaginative writing where you analyse it and you explain in much the same way as I have in this analysis of the three stanzas. You're going to explain how meaning is shaped. Thank you.
If you need help in your Sunday exercise, contact me or your teacher. Thank you.